Kunde. Ja, auf Stern. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mambundo Khamalekana. I am a PhD candidate in the law faculty, a uh, supervisor for Ofsendi Bredman. And I'm also a researcher on the Oxford Human Rights Hub. Um, so I was asked to introduce today's discussion on sexual harassment at work, reflections on its nature and persistence, and uh, changing the legal landscape. On behalf of the Oxford Human Rights Hub, the discussion will be between uh, my supervisor, Prof. Sandra Fredman, uh, who is the director of the Oxford Human Rights Hub. Uh, she's also the Rose Professor of the Laws of the British Commonwealth in the USA at Oxford. Uh, she's acted as an expert advisor on equality law and labour legislation in the EU, Northern Ireland, the UK, India, South Africa, uh, Canada, and for uh, the UN. She's also a barrister practising at All Square Chambers, uh, as well as Dame Laura Cox, uh, who is a High Court Judge of the Queen's Bench Division. Was. Was. <laughs> And former head of Hostess Chambers, uh, she, as a barrister, she specialised in employment law, discrimination, human rights, and she recently led an independent inquiry into billing and harassment of staff in the House of Commons, a uh, report that was published last October. The event is co-hosted by the Oxford Human Rights Hub, the Oxford Law Faculty, the Association of Women's Judges, and sponsored by Cloisters as well. Um, it's part of a celebration of the entry into women into the legal profession in the UK with the passing of the Sex Qualification uh, Removal Act in 1919. So today is both a celebration of the sort of the removal of barriers of women's entry into the legal profession, as well as uh, an inquiry into the persisting structural and systematic inequalities that continue to subordinate women at work. Um, so before handing over, so Sandy asked to sort of like bring into the room uh, a few questions reflecting on uh, race, class, gender, uh, religion, sexual orientation, as well as other forms of status basis advantage, um, rooted in what um, the American feminist writer Bell Hooks calls white supremacist capitalist heteropatriarchy in the world of work. I hope that these will help frame our discussion today and sort of spark questions, um, and also in our lives as we struggle for justice always. So I'm going to make three points and then I'm going to sort of discuss two very quick um, recent examples of why it's still so important to be talking about justice and freedom for women in the legal profession, but also in work in general. So first is sort of just, again, coming back to sexual harassment occurs in the context of like multiple intersecting forms of like disadvantage. Um, so we need to sort of decenter the experience of those who are classed um, in, you know, in like more privileged classes um, who are white, and bring into our discussion the experience of persons who, because of mu ex multiple forms of disadvantage, are the most vulnerable to sexual harassment and sexual exploitation in the workplace. Um, so it would be interesting, considering uh, Dame Cox's report last year, to sort of draw on sort of what you found in relation to class, to race, uh, in the House of Commons. Um, something that sort of, while reading the report yesterday, I was looking for. Second, you know, as we gather to celebrate the entry of women into the legal profession, we also need to look around and excavate the barriers that continue to exclude um, and marginalise some groups because of race, class, religion and other status. So if we look around this room, who is the woman here, what is her class, what is her race? Um, and then sort of if we look at the hands of the woman here, like their free hands, uh, these are free working hands, but again, as lots of feminist writers have sort of um, drawn us to, to allow us to see is that for our hands to be free, there are other women's hands who then have to continue to perform gendered work. And um, what are we doing to free those hands so that the friends that are free, the hands that are free here, are not the only ones? Um, sort of the third one is in the fight against sexual harassment and equality for women at work. I think it's really important that we sort of think critically and perhaps even purge ourselves of the language of diversity. We should be fighting for radical transformation of institutions and for justice, not the inclusion of some women into the ranks of those who profit from uh, current systems of racist, imperialist, uh, patriarchal and, and capitalist domination. Um, it's not just a question of language, it's a signal of regress and, and, and retreat if we continue to talk about diversity and not justice. Um, just to conclude, um, in the last sort of few weeks in South Africa, uh, there we had JSC interviews where we saw one of the, a very sort of prominent female judge uh, being described as demanding, firm, overbearing, and a disciplinarian by two of the most powerful men in the South African legal fraternity. 
To those of us who understand the language of patriarchy and its ideal for the rightful and the rightful behaviour of women weren't surprised when she wasn't recommended for the position that she was being interviewed for, a post on the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Um, in India, uh, an employee of the Supreme Court uh, brought a claim alleging sexual harassment by the most powerful men in the Indian judiciary, the Chief Justice, and uh, she was attacked in the media. She was attacked in very powerful sort of places and in sort of the Indian legal fraternity. Um, her complaint was followed by an ad hoc informal in-house inquiry. I'm quoting sort of the work of like my comrades who are in this room. And um, led by a committee of three Supreme Court judges who are subordinates to the person who was being uh, sort of um, accused of uh, sexual harassment. Um, this week, the, uh, the committee sum summarily dismissed the claim as being without substance and didn't even give a report um, to the public to show us what the process was and how they reached this finding. I mentioned these two examples not because I want to perpetuate the myth of the patriarchal, darker man of the South. I think that's very dangerous, but because I really want to bring us again to this importance of continuing to be angry about the continued subordination of women in the world of work. Um, and I'll sit down and say, just quote uh, one of my favorite writers, Audrey Lord, about anger and why it's important. And she says, anger expressed and translated in the service of our vision and future is liberating and strengthening. So today we should go with these words as we think and we imagine a future for women at work. Thank you. So thanks, uh, is this working? Thanks to Nomfundo. Um, the, the way in which we're going to organize it is we're very lucky to have uh, Justice Jenny Eady here to be the chair, uh, the moderator. She's promised that she was not going to be very hard-handed <laughs> with us. But we are very lucky. Jenny um, has been, uh, was a, a QC at Old Square Chambers, where I actually, although I was much too old in, in my older age, I was a pupil of Jenny's, <laughs> um, briefly. And um, Jenny has practiced employment law for a very long time before going on to the Employment Tribunal and then the Employment Appeal Tribunal, where she sits now. So she's going to be moderating our discussion, and I'll, I'll hand over briefly to you, Jenny. OK, well, what we're going to do is to start with is just to have brief intros from um, Laura and Sandy with some of their perspectives Did you want to speak? on the topic. Um, but we're going to break to start with just have a, um, I think a word from the Association of Women Judges. Uh, I feel as if I'm sort of jumping in and bringing things to a halt. But, um, <laughs> what I want to say, I'm a member of the committee uh, of the Association of Women Judges and with uh, Lorraine Morgan, who sits here with me. I just want to say thank you very much to the Oxford Human Rights Hub and the Law Faculty for hosting this event. Um, Laura was our Vice President. It's a bit like being a Vice Chancellor as a person who does all the work um, on the committee. Uh, this is the second in a series of talks that we're having to celebrate uh, 100 years of women actually being recognised as a woman in law, and were active in the law before that, but this is uh, 100 years of, of women in the law. Uh, this is the second event. We have others going on, one in uh, London in October, something in Edinburgh, uh, and something else towards the end of the year on feminist uh, judgment projects. So uh, keep your eyes open if you're interested. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, we're going to just hear um, uh, sort of brief overviews from uh, Laura and Sandy by way of introduction on their perspectives. Um, then we're going to start um, what we're describing as a conversation, but it's a conversation that includes you. Um, and both Laura and Sandy have agreed that um, they're happy to take questions as we go through. Um, but first of all, I'm going to ask Laura to start off um, by uh, introducing um, her perspective. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? I'm used to shouting from the bench, so I'm going I'm to try and uh, make sure you can hear me without me having to hold the microphone, because I'll probably drop it. Um, <clears throat> when starting a seminar or a conversation uh, like this one, even on a serious topic, which this one plainly is, um, it's often the case that the speaker will begin with some humorous anecdote to sort of settle everybody. But quite honestly, there isn't really much humour involved in sexual harassment. Uh, as the introduction uh, made uh, clear. Um, but I will relate something that I saw very recently 
It was one of those real jaw-dropping moments when you read something in the press that just stops you dead in your tracks, and you may have seen it yourselves. I speak of perfume and the fierce backlash on social media that caused a perfume company to issue an apology and withdraw from the market a perfume they had named sexual harassment. So-called, apparently, in the name of creative freedom, but that little news item tells me a lot about what has gone wrong. We have somehow lost our way. We've lost sight of the importance of human dignity and respect. I think we've become complacent. Uh, a serious and corrosive form of workplace misconduct is being trivialised and devalued constantly in our media. In fact, after decades of apparent progress, I think we're going backwards. We've taken our eye off the ball, and I think we need to press the reset button, and we need to do it pretty quickly. And I want to start in my contribution, but offering some personal perspectives, uh, by saying a few words about courage. Uh, some 20 years into the last century, in one of the many speeches she gave in support of women's political rights, Millicent Fawcett referred expressly to courage. Courage calls to courage everywhere, she said, and its voice cannot be denied. And on her sculpture of Millicent, now standing in Parliament Square, Gillian Waring's use of the banner draws us to those words about courage and tasks us to reflect, I think, upon their provenance and their relevance. The courage that Millicent was referring to was not so much physical bravery, although for many women involved in the suffrage movement, that too was often involved, but moral courage, by which I mean the courage to speak up for and fight within the law for what is right. And a hundred years later, her words seem to me to retain both their relevance and their impact. In almost any area of our law which concerns women, I think that courage has played a vital role in its development. And in my own personal experience over many years representing many women, Nowhere has that been more clearly demonstrated than in the world of work. And I'm speaking of courage on the part of those women and men who have spoken out, who've challenged sex discrimination and inequality in the workplace when they saw it. Courage on the part of those women who have sought to use the law in our courts and tribunals to seek redress for discrimination at work, often in the face of enormous odds, and courage on the part of all those who steadfastly campaigned for law reform when they saw that discrimination law was not delivering, or where there were gaps in the law. And I start with those words about courage tonight, because the topic of this conversation is sexual harassment at work, a particularly serious, corrosive and pervasive form of sex discrimination, disproportionately affecting women, and still today requiring considerable courage on the part of its victims <coughs> to speak out. Uh, in his book on sex discrimination law published in 1985, the year before our law had even recognized sexual harassment as a species of direct sex discrimination, David Panic made this prescient observation, quote, even in the informal setting of an industrial tribunal, a woman complaining of sexual harassment will need to be brave. He was absolutely right. And now, almost 35 years on, <coughs> despite it having been unlawful since 1986, and despite widespread acceptance that it is unacceptable, sexual harassment is truly unremitting. The global reach of the Me Too movement and social media has obviously shone a light on its prevalence in the world of celebrity and beyond. But more significant, in my view, are recent surveys and reports by the TUC, the Fawcett Society, and the Equality and Human Rights Commission, 
which make for disturbing reading. Empirical data has revealed the persistence of sexual harassment in the workplace in both private and public sectors on a shocking scale and in all its forms, from unwelcome sexual jokes or lewd comments about women's bodies, unwanted sexual touching or more serious assaults, and sexual advances and propositions, all from male colleagues, many in positions of authority over the women concerned. And even more worryingly, I think, the data reveals that four out of five women who suffer these indignities do not report it. Of those who did, 80% said nothing changed after they'd reported it. And 18% said complaining, in fact, made the whole situation far worse. So, almost 20 years into the <coughs> 21st century, many of the women who suffer such harassment still have to find the courage to call it out, or to report it, or to pursue a formal internal complaint, or to seek legal redress. Most do not. I should say immediately, I make it absolutely plain, I accept <coughs> that men too can be victims of sexual harassment and when they are, that too is obviously very serious. But this is undoubtedly a problem which primarily affects women. And I say with particular reference to the introductory remarks that were made, all women. It is hampering efforts being made to advance gender equality. It sours working environments and working relationships, and it robs those affected of their dignity and well-being. It is leading to the stifling of women's potential, blighting their careers, and often resulting in the loss to employers that they can ill afford of skilled, talented, and dedicated women. Why on earth is this still happening? If this was still the 70s or the 80s, it would be easier to understand its prevalence. While the term sexual harassment didn't enter the lexicon here until the 1970s, the behaviour which it described had been a feature of the workplace for decades, and there was little that women could do about it. I began my practice as a barrister in 1976, one year after the Sex Discrimination Act came into force. And over the next 10 years, sometimes with support from the Equal Opportunities Commission, or from trade unions, or from Liberty, then the National Council for Civil Liberties, or often acting pro bono, I and other colleagues tried valiantly and usually unsuccessfully to persuade industrial tribunals up and down the land to take it seriously in those cases where a claimant had the courage to submit herself to the ordeal, and it was an ordeal. And I refer to this history tonight because today I see echoes of some of the same problems that I was experiencing as a young barrister in the 70s and 80s. Some of those problems are playing out in the discourse, and I find that very worrying. The first problem, of course, was that the word sexual harassment didn't appear anywhere in the Sex Discrimination Act or, indeed, in the EC Equal Treatment Directive of 1976. Those of us working in the area thought that such misconduct was clearly a form of direct sex discrimination. But some creative judicial interpretation of the legislation was required to deal with a serious problem affecting many women, and the time was not right. The courts and tribunals, populated in the main by men, if not hostile to the new sex discrimination law, were suspicious of it, struggled to make sense of it, and valued it less highly in the hierarchy of legal disciplines. There was no judicial training whatsoever on inequality, or on structural disadvantage, or on the interplay between status and rights, Indeed, there was no judicial training on anything at this time. The training body for the judiciary, the Judicial Studies Board, was only created in 1979, and for most of the first years of its existence, trained only in criminal court trials and sentencing. 
industrial tribunals comprising then a legally qualified chairman, and it was usually a chairman, and employers and union representatives were at this time more used to finding pragmatic solutions in employment disputes that made industrial sense. Women in the main still occupied subservient roles in the workplace, secretaries, receptionists, nurses, typists, telephone operatives, research assistants and the like. Many employers saw them as an entirely secondary workforce. In my experience, sexual harassment complaints were perceived as trivial, a fuss about nothing, or as challenging the status quo or the balance of power in the workplace. It made judges uncomfortable. Claimants' evidence about acts of harassment, often committed behind closed doors, was for understandable reasons uncorroborated, and it was frequently rejected as not credible. The industrial tribunal would take refuge in a claimant's failure to discharge the burden of proof where it was her word against his. The Americans, of course, were grappling with the same problem. In general, I have to say, any reference in our courts to American academics tended to elicit a sniffy response. It still does in some quarters, though less so now. Uh, I would sometimes valiantly refer to research by the self-proclaimed feminist scholar Catherine McKinnon, whose 1970s pioneering work in this field was spot on. But you could almost hear the snorts of derision from the bench. The dynamics of status inequality and structural misogyny in the context of a gender-segregated labour market did not go down too well in the Newcastle Industrial Tribunal, or indeed in the higher courts. In fact, the attitudes which led to this form of behaviour in the workplace were sometimes demonstrated in the tribunal room or the courtroom itself. The industrial members were people, mainly men, whose practices and attitudes in their day jobs often perpetuated discrimination of the kind being complained about. The status, career and value to the organisation of male managers seemed to me to matter more than those of a female secretary or research assistant, both in the workplace and, sadly, in the industrial tribunal. Members of the tribunal would ask my women clients questions which trivialised the acts of which they were, they were complaining, or even sometimes suggested to them that they might be to blame. So, for example, they would be asked, what were you wearing at the time he touched you? Or are you sure you didn't do anything to encourage him? Or surely this wasn't anything to make a fuss about, was it? And I have to say, watching the coverage of the final Senate hearing for Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court nomination, some of these factors seem to me to be still playing out. He matters. His future counts more than hers. He was displaying male strength in the face of female hysteria. Well, in 1986, in the United Kingdom, the law changed. Concepts of dignity and respect for the individual played a crucial role, I think, in enabling our courts and tribunals to find that the principle of direct discrimination, less favourable treatment on the basis of sex, encompassed a prohibition on sexual harassment. In Strathclyde Regional Council against Porcelli, Mrs Porcelli was a science lab technician who had been subjected to a campaign of vindictive and extremely unpleasant harassment, some of which was sexual, by her two male fellow employees in an effort to force her out. She lost her case in the tribunal, <coughs> the tribunal accepting the employer's argument that an unpopular male colleague would have been subjected to similar abuse, and the conduct was not engaged in on the ground of sex but she won on appeal. In the Scottish Court of Session, the President of the Court, Lord Elmsley, in a remarkably enlightened judgment for its time, said he had no difficulty in finding the sexual harassment to be, quotes, a particularly degrading and unacceptable form of treatment 
which it must be taken to have been the intention of Parliament to restrain. Suddenly, the search for a male comparator in these cases was no longer the focus, and the motive for the treatment was regarded as irrelevant. It was the treatment itself that mattered, and part of the campaign adopted against Mrs Porcelli was recognised as a particular kind of weapon based upon her sex, which would not have been used against an equally disliked man. And this important case, I think, marked the beginning of a sea change, a period of time over which tribunals and the higher courts not only came on board, but gradually developed a much fuller understanding and in my experience, an intolerance of this serious and insidious form of sex discrimination and of its harmful effects on the physical and mental health of its victims. I stopped quoting Catherine McKinnon in the courts and I started referring to the analyses and research of someone called Sandy Fredman, which seemed to go down much better. And in 1993 came another hugely important change before then, many employers did not take claims seriously because they didn't need to worry about expensive legal claims against them. Until 1993, compensation for discrimination was subject to an upper limit, as in cases of unfair dismissal. Awards of compensation in successful discrimination cases were very low, neither properly compensating the individuals nor stimulating employers, I think, to take cases seriously. But in 1993, a woman called Helen Marshall challenged the statutory maximum on compensation for discrimination and won her case in the European Court of Justice. Employers now sat up and began to take it very seriously indeed. And they too, I think, over time, developed a much better understanding of the harmful effects of the, this... Uh, form of behaviour on the workplace in terms of low morale, uh, decreased productivity, increased staff turnover, reputational harm and economic costs. And over the years that followed, Europe legislated in this area too and the legal principles were clarified and expanded. More claims were brought by more women and more claims were won rather than lost. And over the years up to 2002, when I became a judge, I spent so much of my time advising employers on training modules and effective anti-harassment policies and protocols and procedures, how to prevent such misbehaviour in the first place and how to tackle it swiftly, properly and fairly if it occurred. It seemed that we might be arriving at a time when sexual harassment could be consigned to the history books. And in 2010, the long-awaited Unifying Equality Act provided a single uniform definition of unlawful harassment going further than the definitions in EU law and setting out clearly the three types of harassment, including in relation to women, unwanted conduct related to sex, or conduct of a sexual nature, which has the purpose or effect of violating the dignity of a person or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment, or treating a woman less favourably because she has either rejected or submitted to conduct of a sexual nature or related to sex. And the International Labour Organization has now agreed a convention expressly addressing the elimination of violence and harassment at work to be adopted, I think, later this year. So the question for us really is why, despite all this learning and progress, has sexual harassment proved so tireless and unyielding? Why has it been endemic to the way we do business and why in 2019 is the picture still so shocking? I anticipate that the discussion which is to follow will address at least some of the reasons for this and hopefully provide some of the answers. Thank you. Thank you. Um,
Uh, can you hear me or should I use the mic? You can hear me? Okay, well, well, well thanks so much to Nomfunda and thanks to Laura for, for that introduction. Um, I thought I would also talk a little bit about my own experiences uh, in the university. Um, uh, so when I first got, when I got my first job um, as an academic in Oxford, I was the only woman tutorial fellow at my college and I joined only one other woman on our governing body in my college. So uh, there was a lot we had to do at that time. We had to draft an equal opportunities policy and we had to draft, or we wanted to draft, a sexual harassment policy. And of course at that time we were all still working out what the concepts were, how to frame them, what the procedures should be. And that was challenging. But what was most challenging was to get our male colleagues to agree it. Um, and probably the thing that stands out most for me was that having drafted it and got it through the governing body, our then head of house said that he would only allow it to go through um, if it could stay in the drawer. And I still remember the drawer in his desk. Um, his reason, well, he gave a, a hunting analogy, which I've conveniently forgotten, <laughs> but the gist of it was that all you need is a procedure and the women will come out and bring lots of spurious claims. So I think, in a way, this is a metaphor for the situation in which we find ourselves. We draft very uh, complex and sophisticated codes and legal materials but because sexual harassment ultimately is about the power structure behind uh, the patriarchy, about the uh, imbalances of power between women and men, ultimately those that remain in power are able to subvert the process and hide it in the drawer um, and, and therefore we cannot really access it. So. Um, as both lawyers and activists and, and feminists, this, this is the, the dilemma which Laura outlined, which, which we need to face, um, uh, particularly because the Me Too movement, as in its resurgence in 2017, um, highlighted the frustration that so many women are feeling with the lack of proper attention to be paid and the need to use other means, uh, social media, um, publicity, collective action. And the challenge for us now is how we can make use of this energy to really bring the kind of uh, procedures which we, and, and concepts which we've been working on for so long, to really deeply change the culture and change the power structures uh, against which they operate. Um, so from a legal perspective, there have been some really important developments, as, as Laura has outlined, and perhaps I could add to what she said by just pinpointing four. Um, the first is this extremely important movement in the definition away from the idea of non-consensual behaviour to the concept of unwanted or unwelcome behaviour. And this centres the experience of the, the person it, we've had lots of debates about how objective it should be, particularly because uh, the definition also talks about purpose or impact. Um, but what we need to hold on to most of all is the centering of the experience of the person, that it's unwanted, unwelcome from her perspective. Uh, the second which, uh, really important development which Laura has highlighted already is to see sexual harassment as its own cause of action so that we no longer have to pursue these really uh, somewhat absurd attempts to find a male comparator and real tribunal decisions to say you would have treated the men equally badly. So we're, we're away from that. Um, the introduction through the EU law of the concept of dignity was also of great importance to, to this discourse, although we also need to be sure that it's, we remember that it's not only about dignity, because sexual harassment is uh, both the cause and has the effect of 
continuing women's disadvantage, socioeconomic disadvantage, continuing to silence many women, and continuing to prevent proper structural change from happening. Uh, the third and really important development is to introduce uh, the idea not just of harassment against this individual woman, but the uh, hostile environment, so that the structures, the, the um, atmosphere in which a woman and others who are affected by this work becomes just as important. And of course in those days we thought about page three, the sun all over the walls, and women complained about that. Now it's screensavers, the, what people put out on social media, and the general uh, atmosphere. And the fourth, um, and particularly important, but never quite properly operationalized, is the idea of employer's liability, both, both primary liability and vicarious liability because in the end it's the employer who needs to be made responsible for uh, the workplace culture. But we haven't only moved forward, as Laura has so poignantly said, and some of this has been actual removal of some important parts of the statutory structure, both by the coalition government and the conservative government after that. Um, one of the most important ones was to remove the provision making employers liable for third-party harassment, and we think of customers, clients, but there, you can think of carers in people's homes who are particularly vulnerable. And I was very struck, looking back at the consultation paper by the Government Equality o Office in 2012, in the process of uh, removing this, and this was none other than Theresa May, who was then in the Home Office, and what she said is in, in the workplace, most businesses do everything they can to ensure that their employees can work in an environment free from harassment, whatever its source. Uh, this is right and proper. <laughs> I'm sure you rec uh, recognise that <laughs> phrase. Um, and then she said, but the third party harassment provisions remain on the statute book, creating a potential regulatory burden on business to no apparent good purpose. Well, we can put that next to, five years later, the Women in Equalities <coughs> Committee report, uh, as well as Laura's own report, but the Women in Equalities report, com Committee report uh, particularly pointed out how surprised they were that while so many women recognised sexual harassment at the workplace, so many employers knew nothing about it or claimed to know nothing about it. Um, the second way in which... Um, we've taken a step backwards is in relation to remedies. Now, the, the cap was lifted and that's been a really important point, um, but remedies for uh, discrimination have always been very weak. There's never been an injunctive remedy. It's only, apart from damages, a recommendation. But what was achieved in 2010, which was a great breakthrough, was to include a recommendation which was not only about this individual mm. incident, but could make mm. recommendations as to the general policies and practices mm. of the employer. And this again, again I looked at the consultation uh, document about removing that provision where it said um, this is a burden on business, uh, it's not enforceable, why do we need it on the statute books? And even more so, it said a recommendation about policies and practices meant the tribunal was taking on the role of an equalities consultant. <laughs> so this was the reason for removing it. Um, so that means that the structural basis for sexual harassment remains invisible. And there are many, as well as removing those things, there have been many lost opportunities. Perhaps the most important is not bringing into effect the provision on uh, intersectional discrimination. It was always a fairly moderate provision, um, but it was there. And, uh, and that means that, um, in the way that Nomfundo described this uh, so well, um, we, we really have to work very hard to make sure that we take into account the experience of all women and the social location and recognise that <coughs> when uh, various different uh, grounds are all uh, combined or the, it intensifies the experience in ways 
which we have to take into account and understand. Um, and this leads to the second issue, which is endemic in our employment legislation, which is that it only covers workers under a contract of employment or a contract post for personal services. And that means that so many workers, precarious workers, informal workers, are left out of the protection, even though they are often the most vulnerable migrant workers, domestic workers, um, informal sector workers, etc. Uh, the third lost opportunity is the public sector equality duty, which really could be a great, a, a very powerful weapon because it's meant to be a proactive duty on employers to, um, to look for the problem and solve it. But it's actually an incredibly weak duty. It mm. only means that you have to have regard to the need to eliminate unlawful discrimination. I've always thought this was quite strange. Mm. Since it's already unlawful, why do you only have to have regard mm -hmm. rather than fixing it? Mm. But that's how it is, and that despite many attempts to get that to str uh, strengthen, mm. we haven't yet achieved it. So, um, in a sense, this leads back to the beginning, the, the problem, the real difficult problem of how we reach the cultural and power structural issues which continue to reseed, remake, and perpetuate this problem um, of ensuring. And, and how do we really get to be sure that those who are in power, like the, my head of college all those years ago, are still not able to take all these procedures that we have, subvert them, and try to conceal them? Um, so how do we go about that? Ending on the same question as Laura did, <laughs> over to our conversation. Thank you. <laughs> um, before we start the conversation, I just like your anecdote about the uh, putting the policy in the drawer. I had a case where my client, um, public sector employers, um, hadn't disclosed their rather brilliant equal opportunities policy. My opponent asked for it. And when I asked my clients, I said, could we just get that to the tribunal then, please? And they said, that's a bit difficult because that's locked in the governor's office. Um, it's in a glass cabinet in the governor's office. We're very proud of it. We spend a lot of time working on that, and we don't take that out. Um, <laughs> uh, so as long as it's there, locked carefully in the office. Um, Laura, I want to uh, I'll start by just picking up on something you talked about, um, so the idea of courage and, and judicial attitudes, judicial courage. Porcelli can be seen as an example, perhaps, of judicial courage. Um, but although we're now in a very different place, and we have a lot more women in the judiciary, not enough, but more, um, though there is training now, which does include diversity training, um, do you think there really has been um, a change in judicial attitudes? Um, certainly the success rate is still not that high, um, these cases. What's your view on that? Well, I do think, I think within the employment tribunals, there has been a sea change. Um, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm hearing anecdotes or reports or reading cases, I suppose, because I haven't got any personal experience for a large number of years. But I think um, there has be, been greater judicial awareness of the structural problems that lead to this sort of behaviour in the employment tribunal, not least because I think there were some extremely good concentrated uh, training programs rolled out for the employment tribunal judges or in tr em employment tribunals generally in these cases, well in discrimination cases generally, but particularly I think sexual harassment cases. And a lot, not just the law, but understanding it conceptually and structurally and you know, looking, at it, looking at, it, at it in context. Now that is a very good um, state of affairs and I think there has been also similar training programs for employment appeal tribunals. You have to go through specialised training courses in the employment tribunals before you're allowed to even sit on these cases. So that's where I think most progress has been made. I have to say, in the court system, and the higher up you go, the less good it is, and the less familiarity and understanding there is. Um, and that, I think, is in part because there hasn't been that sort of in-depth training that there ought to be 
for the judges who are called upon to decide these cases and decide essentially important test case legal issues and policy questions in the highest courts. Um, and unfortunately, despite the efforts of a number of us who were involved in judicial training over the years, um, judicial training for the senior judiciary was never seen as mandatory, it was something they could opt into. Uh, most of them thought it was going to be a cosy sort of academic conversation, so the thought of having to be peer-reviewed and actually take part in a mock hearing with actors was something they didn't warm to at all, whereas in fact that's the kind of training that really brings these cases home and gets a better understanding. So the answer to your question is that I still think there are disappointing judicial attitudes, and from my own personal perspective, I can remember when I was asked to head up the training on the Equality Act, which was really dealt with a bit like the Human Rights Act. You had a full day's training. Every judge at every level was required to go on this training. And I could not believe some of the comments being made by some of the s senior members of the judiciary. It was you know, quite gobsmacking that there were these attitudes being expressed. Uh, so I agree that that is a, a real concern. That is a real concern, and I would say that that is responsible. There are some obvious exceptions, and I'm not denigrating the entire judiciary, but I think it becomes a lottery, you know, which court you end up in front of. Because I sometimes read some court, very bizarre court of appeal decisions because it's a tribunal that just doesn't understand the indirect discrimination, for example. <laughs> Sandy, um, I, I want to see if you have any views on this, and also about the idea of... Um, the issue of diversity in the judiciary. Uh, it's obviously quite a big issue for um, the recruitment of judges. Um, and yet, when you look at the senior levels, it's, it's a bit like academia. Um, the women seem to disappear. Um, do you have anything to add on that? Um, yes, I think... Um, so, well, you were probably... Maybe you would want to answer this first, because I think you... I'm we, keeping we would, my, my head down. We would be really interested <laughs> in your experience, given your own position. And maybe I could... Okay. And we've also got some other, other judges. Um, yeah. I mean, one of my experiences as both um, as a practitioner, um, but also as a judge, is um, it doesn't necessarily, having a woman, doesn't necessarily make the difference in the decision. But I do think it makes a big difference in the culture of the court mm -hmm. or the circuit. Um, and um, I sometimes think that our role is to educate um, our colleagues um, not just through our decision making, um, but in our interactions. So the idea of a critical mass of women um, is, for me, is quite an important issue. Do we have any contributions from the association? I, I agree, because it is numbers. And it, when I first started on the bench, it was enormously difficult um, to be one of the few women around to try and in any way influence or change attitudes. I, I remember very distinctly that some of the first diversity training we had, which was way back in the last century, and I sat with a group of much older judges than I, who were commenting on some remarks that had been made about an example given of a woman walking down the street at night who might feel uncomfortable followed closely as I'm walking behind her by a black man. And I said, I think a woman walking down the street at night would feel uncomfortable if any man <laughs> is walking rather too closely behind her. And the response was, well, if we're going to have all that feminist nonsense, we're not going to get very far in this discussion, are we? And that was the attitude. That was 1995, was that attitude. Um, it has changed. There are numbers that have been... It is the, the critical mass, as you say, mm. women, that can change that. But again, that's a very slow process, and one that is, there's far too complacent attitudes about recent appointments. It will, um, when you look at how the percentages and numbers are eventually going to change, it's going to take a very long time, I'm afraid. And I do think the women judges need to speak out. Mm. Um, because one of the problems that I've faced is trying to get some of my female colleagues at senior levels to speak out mm. about these problems, but there is a reluctance to do that, and I can understand that, but I think until we get critical mass, it's terribly important that women do speak out about these problems and complain. I mean, I, I remember getting into terrible trouble 
when there was a day's training for all the judges sitting in the administrative court and I looked at the training programme and all the facilitators and all the speakers and all the participants, bar one, were men. And I made a fuss about it, you know, and I got a very nasty letter from the then Lord Chief Justice for being a troublemaker and why didn't I try and help rather than criticise? And so I volunteered to arrange the training for the next, <laughs> but it wasn't accepted. But, I mean, that's the kind of problem. And I, and, I, and I think if you try and make a difference, you get labelled as, you know, you're one of them, you're not one of us. I think that's part of the problem, mm. is that we are very keen to be seen as being men and men, mm. rather than because we're a coat and woman. Mm. Um, but it's quite difficult then um, to... I mean, our association has a problem. We are LGBT women mm. and women in the, in the uh, in the Burrows and Church and came and came to speak came when suddenly judges in, so we're a wide association. But people see us, we have a name for being the judges' part because we're a, a, affiliated to an international organisation. But some people see us as a women's trade union, which it isn't. We're concerned about issues uh, in relation to equality, discrimination. Um, but I think there is a fear that if you are too much branded as a feminist, mm. well, feminist troublemaker, the same thing. Okay, so what I want to do is now just um, come on to the conversation about the, the process, the process of bringing a claim um, and how we ensure fairness. Um, so uh, there's the fairness to the person who's facing the allegation. Um, there's also the need to ensure that the process um, doesn't re-victimise. Um, Laura described it earlier as an ordeal. Um, I mean, this is not just a, an issue in um, sexual harassment cases in the workplace, but um, uh, sexual assault cases, rape cases um, in the criminal courts, um, sometimes in the family courts. This is, there's a tension sometimes um, there. Sadly, in terms of how the, the, we can respect due process and ensure fairness, uh, for how do, alleged perpetrators, how do we also not allow um, the ordeal, um, trial by ordeal for the victim? So I think this is one of the big uh, challenges that, that we face. Um, and clearly the Me Too movement was necessary because of the failure of proper procedures and of people having confidence in the procedures which, which are available. But on the other hand, we do still have to ensure fairness to everyone all the way around. So, um, first of all, the, the tribunal procedure itself, and maybe we'll come on to talk about that later, but the tribunal, um, access to tribunals is, is not easy. Um, it's still, even with the removal of the fees, it's still uh, very adversarial. It's difficult to access. The whole idea of walking off the street into an informal setting has long been lost. Um, so I think we, we certainly need to improve the accessibility of that, but even that might be much too late. And the very first thing that needs to be done are proactive measures within the workplace to prevent uh, these things happening in the first place, but even if they do happen to make people feel comfortable. Um, so Again, that's why I think that the, the equality duty is such an important model of actually putting some kind of proactive duties on employers to provide for a workplace where this is just not acceptable, where people know ahead of time it's not acceptable, and where the culture is, re is, is entirely reset in a very different way. That would mean that um, people could feel safe in standing up, safe in speaking out, and would also feel that uh, it's not going to be regarded as just troublemaking. But obviously we, we're going to still have complaints, <coughs> and I think we're going to, we, we really need something that is quick, transparent, nothing in the drawer the, or the cabinet, <laughs> that everybody knows who, who to refer to. And one of the things which would be very nice to know other people's views about is 
that when we were drawing up the harassment procedures in those early days, we thought it very important to put in an informal stage, knowing that we were in situations where people would most likely continue to have to exactly. work together, to be students together, to continue to relate to each other. And we were quite optimistic, I think, that procedures could be put in place where misunderstandings could be cleared, people could have their say, people, mm. other people could apologise, mm. and in, in some ways things could be changed from there. Um, actually trying to operate that, uh, certainly as a college fellow, is, is really very difficult. Yeah. And it would be good to know what everyone else's experiences are because you have to be extremely skilled to make that informal process That's work. Absolutely right. You have to be able to confront people mm. with things they have done. Uh, you have to have to make both sides feel safe in coming to some kind of reconciliation without in any sense negating the, the person's complaint. So I still hold out for the importance of finding some way to, I guess, repair relations make people change their ways before we push them into this very adversarial situation where everybody becomes defensive, yeah, exactly. people then dig in. But how we actually make it work, how we get the skilled people who can bring these sides together, I think we were quite naive at that time in expecting that to happen. So I'd be really interested in other people's views mm. about that. But it does have to be quick, it has to be transparent. People need to know that they can feel safe and won't be re-victimised. Re but both sides also need to know that they're going to get a fair hearing. Mm. I quite agree. Just picking up on the, you mentioned the Me Too movement. Um, there was some discussion in that um, of uh, that the starting point should be to leave the victim. Laura, as somebody who <laughs> um, sat for a number of years, how do you feel about that? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think there should be no prejudgings, that's for sure. Um, but I absolutely agree with Sandy that the starting point has to be some means of the person who is claiming to be a victim speaking in confidence rapidly to someone trained to listen to them, to make some sort of assessment of the kind of complaint and probably as to its genuineness. I mean, you know, you do... The training and experience gives you a sort of flavour um, I mean, for example, when I was doing the House of Commons inquiry, it was just me. There wasn't any adversarial process playing out. So I found myself having to um, deploy the same skills when I was listening to complaints being relayed to me as I was when I was sitting as a judge with a litigant in person, for example. And you, you sort of get used to certain signals and, and things that you pick up on or that you ask a question about that gives you perhaps the hint that everything is perhaps not quite what it seems. But that comes through training and experience. And I think whoever is charged with the first, the first base to which the person with the complaint is to go has to be that person who makes that sort of judgment. And I don't think you should be blind about it. I think you should be open to it. But you shouldn't go into it expecting that whatever's said, I've got to believe them. But nor should you go into it, go into it with the other extreme, you know, that being sort of cynical or suspicious about it or looking for holes in it. Would an inquisitorial system be better? Yeah, I think so. Um. I think so. I mean, I think look, looking in, and listening to what Sandy was saying, I absolutely agree. And be interesting to hear what other people's views are about this, about the, the principles that you need to have in any process in the workplace. Uh, and I think probably there are some very good procedures in drawers and cupboards. You know, which, which I probably and, and others wrote, you know, in 1992 or something, you know, that, that need to be got out and dusted off because these sorts of things that Sandy was talking about with, with the faculty, with, you know, these sort of what do we put in it, w w what, these were the sorts of points that we were thinking about. Um, but I think they've just, you know, somehow just been forgotten about um, and just they need to be got out and, and dusted off. And I think that it's absolutely right that speed and fairness and proportionality, I would add in, I think is, is a, a very important part of how these cases are dealt with. I think the good employers know this and deal with them promptly and very well. And I heard in the Commons inquiry some very good line management, obviously, that things were resolved very quickly, informally, in the way that Sandy says, 
apologies were given, everybody went on, and nobody's career was damaged. It, it didn't drag out for months with everybody becoming entrenched. Um, but the other ones just got into a complete spin, you know, and didn't know what to do. And that, again, I think, is training. Well, just picking up on um, some of the points you said about uh, people who suffer particular disadvantage of the workplace and picking on something that Infundo said at the mm. outset, the issue about intersectional mm. um, discrimination. And I, I certainly remember doing cases when I was at the bar where it, it wasn't, the harassment wasn't just meted out to her because she was a woman. It was mm. because she was a woman of a particular uh, ethnic background um, or because she had a disability. And there were stereotypes coming in which were more complex. And it made it very difficult um, to run the case because, of course, it was being said, well, you know, other women aren't making these complaints. Um, and it was because there were a number of uh, protected characteristics engaged. Um, Sandy, can you want to offer us any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, well, I think, you know, Nofono was quite right to put that right at the start and yeah. the centre of this. So, um, we know that the Me Too movement was actually started by Tarana Burke, who mm. was an African-American woman. And in fact, I, and I only just I only discovered this recently, that that very first uh, US case which established uh, sexual harassment, marital, ma and marital savings ma and Vinson was mm. brought by uh, an African-American mm. woman too. So um, clearly the, the, there had been a lot of criticism of the resurgence of the Me Too movement as uh, actually invisibilizing and silencing those, I, those early crusading pioneering positions. And that's very, that, that is uh, really problematic um, and a, a great indictment of the people who are, who are doing or who are um, negating the, the history of, mm. the, of the Me Too movement. So I think um, we, you know, the, the other thing to remember is that in India the Vishaka case was brought by Dalit, was not brought by, but was about a Dalit woman mm. as well, and that was the case which established sexual harassment. So um, mm. what we need to do is to always remember that what sexual harassment is about is background power structures and the power imbalances are not evenly distributed. But in the case of sexual harassment, they affect women at all levels, Absolutely. although more intensely and in a different way, the more, the more vulnerable you are. And to me, the important thing is that um, women have to r retain solidarity. The, the women who can bring the kind of cases which are groundbreaking, who can make use and articulate these positions need to make sure that they also uh, encompass er all the experiences of all women. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you said that women, it's a very, it's a big concept and it doesn't have to only, it can't, it shouldn't be captured by privileged white women either. So the, um, in that exactly. sense, the, the ways in which sexual harassment is experienced differs according to your social location. It may be more intense, but it is, it is an issue which affects everyone, all women and other people in, in, in situations of, balance of imbalance of power. So I think that is, it's very important that we, we maintain that solidarity. The problem with the whole intersectionality analysis, I think the risk of it, is that it splinters, lots, it splinters into lots of little small identity ca categories which then begin to, um, it's like divide and rule in a way. And we shouldn't really allow that to happen. And so the identity politics side of it is not necessarily the right way to be going, but much more the solidarity approach. Lou, I just wondered your view on that. I mean, it strikes me as the, um, you know, one of the protected characteristics which never came into play, the socioeconomic um, uh, characteristic. Uh, 
if we see sexual harassment as um, a form of abuse of power. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, something you talked about at the beginning, the, very often it's somebody who has authority over the complainant. Um, do you want to add something on that um, and how uh, those structures create the problem? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with what Sandy's just said. Her analysis is the one I wholly uh, agree with. It seems to me that in a lot of sexual harassment cases, in most of them, I would say, it's about a, an abuse of power. Um, and certainly looking back at all the cases, or most of the cases that I was involved in, uh, I had a whole, the whole range. I had disabled women, I had gay women, I had, you know, women of colour. I, I mean, you know, and it, you, you, you're sort of, and, you know, the socioeconomic, different socioeconomic mm. categories. Um, and it was run just as a sex discrimination mm. case. But, of course, everybody's <coughs> experience is different. And I sometimes feel it would help tribunals if they were able to look at the whole picture and um, look at it as take, a, take an overview, take a holistic approach to the experience of the particular individual in front of them. So I absolutely agree with that. So what I'm going to ask now is, is go back to the, the law that we started from in this conversation um, and the idea of law reform. What role has law reform got to play in this change? Um, what, what would you like to see? Um, what, um, either, uh, whether it's procedural law or substantive law, what would you like to see? What, why do you think that would have a positive impact? Laura? My wish list. Yeah. My wish on. list. Well, I think we've touched on, Sandy certainly has touched on some of them already when she uh, gave her opening introduction. Um, I do think that the, uh, and this is something that the Equality Commission and the Fawcett Society also called for, um, I do think the third party harassment provision, section 40, should be reinstated. Uh, I think in the original section 40, there was a provision that an employer had to be aware of two previous incidents of harassment and to have failed to take reasonable steps to prevent this third party from harassing. I think that's excessive. I think once the employer knows there's been one incident by this person, you know, there should be a duty. So I would simplify it and I would, I would reinstate section 40. Um, I would extend the protection from harassment under section 26 to pregnancy and maternity because actually one of the things the, um, I think first the Equal Opportunities Commission uh, did quite a bit of research on how women, pregnant women and women um, coming back from maternity leave were particularly vulnerable to harassment. So I put that back in. Um, I'd extend the limitation period for complaining about acts of harassment to six months from the latest of either the last, the date the last act of harassment took place or the uh, completion of any internal procedure to, to deal with it. I mean, we all, everybody now knows there's plenty of literature on the failure to report it and the reasons why we, women are reluctant. And I think the time limit, present time limit, is just too high. Um, I think the, the whole question of intersectionality is hugely important, and I think it's a great shame uh, that that wasn't uh, enacted. I, I think that ought, merits revisiting. Um, I certainly would um, restore the power to make recommendations, which Sandy was referring to, because that was a really good weapon that tribunals who'd sat for several weeks sometimes hearing really awful evidence about the way a, an organisation was running itself, that was a really good weapon to make practical recommendations as to what the employer needed to do to put their house in order. And I think that would be hugely valuable. And I'd certainly reintroduce the statutory questionnaire, which was a, such a useful way of getting in advance hold of information about what was going on and sometimes, I don't know whether your experience was the same, journey. I think just the very act of answering the questionnaire told an employer, crikey, we can't defend this, <laughs> you know, and, and there'd be some sort of um, uh, opening of eyes to what had been going on and, and something was then done about it. So that's probably my wish list. That's probably enough to be going on with. So one of the interesting things we found, we were wondering uh, uh, when people take silk, there is a ceremony where they wear the full-bottomed wig and all that gear. And they come round to each of the courts that they regularly appear in front of, and they do a sort of a bowing thing. 
you know, kind of weird, but anyway. Uh, and so in the Employment Appeal Tribunal, um, which you know, we are uh, a court of record that hears a lot of these cases, we found it surprising that in the employment law world, we kept seeing rows of men in front of us, white men, um, you know, terribly nice and it's a lovely day for them, etc. And their families are there and it's, it's a very nice ceremony. But it, it was just surprising to us um, that it just kept looking the same. And we thought we ought to do something about this. And we looked into the figures. And of, um, you know, these are small stats, because obviously it's a small community who would be applying. But of, in the last three years of 34 um, applicants for silk who do employment law, employment law and discrimination, only five had been female. And that's astonishing because the employment law bar at that level is about 50-50 men, women. Mm. That's just astonishing. And so those people who are going into positions of power, because it's the silks who make the head of chambers, it's the silks who become the judges, you know, whether that's right or wrong, that is how it is. Um, and that really surprised us mm. as to why that was happening. Um, you know, again, my generation, why on earth is that going on? Um, what, what, what's going on here? Um, and, uh, and, and it's also interesting as when a change does happen, how again, you, be, you become complacent about it and um, sometimes people make a remark which make you realise that you've become complacent. So again, in my court, my very limited little world there, uh, the Employment Appeal Tribunal has been in existence since the 1970s and it wasn't, I think Laura was one of the first women to sit there, um, which would have been about the 1990s, mm, I guess. Yeah. Um, and uh, very recently, um, the president, the first president, was a woman, um, and uh, I was the first female senior circuit judge appointed there. We happened to have a woman appointed in Scotland, and the three of us were doing some talks. And it was commented on that, look, oh, it's now all women. It's now all women, isn't it? Um, it's positive discrimination. It's all women in this court. Uh, to which I had to respond. <laughs> When we've been there, all women, for 20 years, and nobody has said anything, then talk to me, you know. Uh, because that's what happened. It was 20 years before there was a woman sitting in the Employment Appeal Tribunal, the court of record that deals with discrimination cases. And somebody thinks it's appropriate to comment on the fact that there's a few women just happen to be passing through at the moment, um, at this time. So I think it's that critical mass point, it's that um, uh, changing the way we see it, changing what we expect to see. Um, from my perspective, that's really important, um, and men have a role to play in that, um, for sure. Going back to the law reform point, and I just pick up on those, one of the things which um, I've always found interesting is there's that wonderful carrot in the legislation for employers that you can avoid liability if you've taken all reasonably practical steps to avoid the discriminatory um, behaviour. Um, and in 23 years of practice, um, I acted for an employer and used that successfully once, <laughs> which is astonishing. Mm, it is astonishing. Um, with all those policies you've been drafting mm. for them, mm. why are they not using them? Why are they not getting the training? Why are they not bringing their HR people in, doing the training to, so they can avoid liability? So that, an idea of reform which somehow does something about that, and I think that also ties in with something that you said about the public sector equality duty, which I was hopeful about and seems terribly disappointing. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, absolutely. Because that was going to be the proactive measure. It was. Again. It was the transformative measure. <laughs> Next stage, equality rights, and it's all very disappointing. And so yeah. can you, what, what do you think, in terms of law reform, law as the mechanism for change, what would you have? Um, well, all the things that everyone said, plus I think we, um, we need to think out of the box. Mm. Um, one, one of the recommendations of the Women in Qualities Committee in the House of Commons was um, much stronger remedies. I would go for injunctive remedies, mm. much higher, um, much higher mm. damages. Mm. In fact, they drew the analogy with data protection. If you mm. as an employee breach data protection, you can get a fine, I think, of up to 20 million exactly, euro, yeah. or 4% of mm. turnover. How yeah. would that be as a disincentive <laughs> compared exactly. to this carrot of uh, <laughs> taking the right procedures? I think it would put the, the, it would give the right priority to what employers should do. But I think also, really, really importantly and crucially, um, we need to bring in precarious workers. We need to be sure that 
they are also protected because the more you leave workers like that out, the more mm. employers have an incentive Absolutely. to reclassify, mm. to push them That's out, true. to contract out, and they are then uh, the most vulnerable. But I think there has to be joint and several liability across everyone possible. So mm. The, mm. the person who em employs, who the domestic worker works in someone's house, the person who's the agency, the person who's the platform, mm. and the, they mm. need to be strong, proactive duties labor inspectorates, health and safety executives, mm. you know, you say everything that there is, that they have to be oh, all sure. different possible, you know, collective mm. solidarity as between different workers, mm. Um, mm. but we really need to pay most attention of all the things we do to those workers. I, I think what may help a lot in that is the International Labour Organization Convention, because once that is ratified, once that comes into effect, then every member state will have to give a, give a report as to how they're protecting. And it will, it's applying to all workers. So all those workers, the government will be expected to provide reports on how they're being protected and how labour inspectors are able to go in and find out these abuses. And there'll be all sorts of reports coming in via the UN to the ILO. And that, that they'll at least be you know, monitoring at a global level. And, and inspections. I mean, I know it all takes forever, but it seems to me it's a very important convention that the ILO, it's unusual for them to pass a new convention. And certainly when I was working with the ILO, you know, sexual harassment was just sort of an afterthought. You know, again, it wasn't particularly mentioned in uh, Convention 111, the, the Equality Convention. So I think this is, this has the, the prospect of getting to the heart of those sorts of cases. Well, with that positive note, I'm yes, going to bring I this think it's to a good end. place. Yeah. Um, I think there's some drinks outside. Please keep the conversation going. Uh, please do ask questions of us. Um, if you see us outside, um, please join us for a drink. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm so